thanks very much. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here today. Um, I'm waiting for my slides, here we go. So, I want to go back to a question that I think has been implicit in a lot of the conversations we've been having today, which is this issue around what makes for a good life. Now, as we've heard in many presentations, this is a question that philosophers have been debating for thousands of years. And arguably, they are much better qualified than me, a policy analyst from the OECD, to answer this question. Nonetheless, I think one of the central themes of the presentation I'll be giving today is that we need a broad dialogue about this question. We need to involve economists, we need to involve psychologists, philosophers, academics of all disciplines. We need to involve policy analysts, we need to involve government ministers, but crucially, we also need to involve the public in this discussion. Why do I say this? Because the question of what makes a good life is something that governments implicitly answer every time they spend money. Resources in government are inevitably scarce and trade-offs are a natural part of governing. Whenever you're deciding to spend money, you need to decide how to prioritize between different objectives. This concept of well-being and happiness helps us to think about how to make those choices much more explicit so that we can have a proper global dialogue on happiness. So, in 2011, the OECD reshaped its mission towards better policies for better lives. In order to achieve that mission, we need an agreed way to define and measure what better lives look like. One approach we've heard a lot about already today is the idea of looking at activity in the economy as a way to gauge the success of societies. So this number here, which is annual dom gross domestic product growth in volume terms, this is a common way to measure the success of societies. And we've all become a bit captured by this number, especially in terms of government, in terms of the media, and actually in terms of the wider public too. Money is important, there's no question, and again, we've heard a lot about this already this morning. It gives us the freedom to choose, it gives us the ability to buy things that we value to deliver the well-being that we're seeking. But it's not in itself a measure of the success of societies. It's a means to an end, not an end result. So if we're trying to measure what matters, GDP is a means, it's a driver of well-being and happiness. It's not the end result. So in terms of a measure of progress, it's not going to cut it. Again, the downsides of using GDP as a measure of progress or welfare are, are well known and we've heard about them this morning. But in particular, GDP tells us little about who is benefiting from any growth that we're seeing. It tells us really nothing about how sustainable that activity is, both in terms of sustainability over time, but also in relation to environmental resources. And of course, many of the public and private goods that governments are most interested in have no market prices. So things like clean air, leisure, security, social relationships. These are things that we can't price, so we can't count them in GDP, certainly not very easily, but that doesn't mean that they have no value. And indeed, we have a saying, some things are priceless, um, and for everything else, there's GDP. There is an alternative, and as we've heard this morning for many people in the room, the alternative is happiness, but how do we define that in a concrete way that can be measured and put into practice in public policy? Well, the OECD for the last six years or so have been trying to develop this framework, which is something that we call well-being. It's an alternative for measuring the progress of societies, and there are several different components to it. As you can see in the top part of the diagram, we've got individual well-being. In the lower half, we've got the sustainability of well-being over time. So if we look at current well-being, individual well-being, there are broadly two different elements that the OECD focus on. On the one hand, there are material conditions. So again, things like income and wealth, jobs and earnings, and housing. On the other side, we've got factors that we describe as quality of life. And that includes a range of different dimensions, from health status and work-life balance, through to education and skills, social connections, 
civic engagement and governance, environmental quality, personal security, and last but not least, subjective well-being. The bottom half of the diagram is focused on the resources that help to sustain well-being over time. And here we're particularly interested in things like environmental resources that in this diagram is called natural capital, economic capital, um, human capital, so the health and education and skills that people have, but also social capital, which is about the relationships that help society to function better. So we heard again quite a bit about trust, and trust is one of the components of social capital. So the key features of the measurement approach for the OECD, it's a focus on people rather than just the economic system. What do I mean by that? Well, when we're trying to capture something like income, we look at household disposable income, so the money that people actually have available to spend, rather than looking at the aggregate, what's available in the economy at large. We're actually interested in what's in people's pockets that they can spend on, on the things that matter to them. We're also interested in showing the diversity of experience. So we report on inequalities, not just averages. So that both means sort of summary measures of inequality. So a classic summary measure would be something like the Gini coefficient of income distribution that tries to capture a, a measure of the dispersion of the overall income. But we're also interested in inequalities between groups. So between men and women, between young and old, between high and low educated, and between high and low income. So we're trying to capture sort of the diversity of experience across a whole range of different factors. We have an emphasis on objective living conditions, but we're also interested in how people feel about their lives. So we have a mixture of subjective and objective approaches in here. Because of course, if we're trying to capture how people experience their lives, we, we need to ask them how they feel as well. As I said, we're concerned with well-being both today and tomorrow, so this isn't just current well-being here and now, it's how you are sustaining the resources that will keep your well-being going over time. And a crucial point, what we've got here is a list of ingredients, not a prescriptive recipe for well-being. Now, I focus on this a little bit because I think it's a particularly important point when it comes to policy applications. This is both a challenge to deal with, but also an opportunity, and we'll come back to this. So nonetheless, there is a heavy demand for a single index of well-being, and this is a challenge that we are repeatedly faced with. When we have our nice dashboard of measures, everybody says, well, that's great, but how does it all add up? This is difficult to do. These different elements of life don't add straightforwardly into a single number, because you have to then decide, well, what matters most, what's most important. That's a very difficult conversation to have with statisticians and economists, and arguably we're not the right people to make that judgment. So instead, the OECD built an interactive website where people can decide for themselves what they feel is most important, and it's called the Better Life Index. How does it work? Well, when people arrive at the site, they're presented with this dashboard, um, and they're invited to, to rate on this tool here the importance that they want to assign to our 11 different dimensions of life. Based on the ratings that people provide us, there's then data behind the scenes, all the data that we collect on all of these different dimensions. We calculate a personalized index according to the ratings that people provide us, and you can then see how the different OECD countries compare on your own personalized index. Now, instead of showing you the spreadsheets of Excel data, which they're all available, if that's your thing, we can provide it, but on the website, what we do is actually show flowers. Um, so the, the height of the stalk of the flower is the overall performance on your index, and then the width of the petals on the flower tell you how you're doing in each of the different dimensions, and it's all beautifully color-coded. So, what do Better Life Index users tell us? Well, we've had over 9.5 million visits to the site since we launched it in 2011. There's an option when you visit the site to share your index with the OECD. So, we don't automatically collect the data, but when people arrive, if they're willing to share their ratings with us, we're collating all of that information. And we've got about 120,000 users who have shared their information with us. <coughs> 
What do they tell us? Well, the headline is that people want to be healthy, happy, and wise. So the top scoring uh, dimensions are typically health, life satisfaction, and education. And we can see that safety and work-life balance often come within the top five as well. But I think overall, another thing to really highlight here is that actually every domain sim seems to be important. There isn't a single domain that is routinely listed as unimportant. So the red line on this chart shows what the result that we would get if everybody rated every dimension exactly equally. So we can see that the, there are preferences coming through but it's also clear that every domain matters. Now, I come from the statistics directorate in the OECD, so I have to flag that there are a number of very important caveats to this data. The first thing to say is that the, the website was designed as a communications tool. It was never actually designed to elicit people's preferences. And arguably, if you're really serious about this question of what matters to people, there are much better ways of asking those questions than, it, than I've just shown you. And there are many academics who are working on the methodology of this to, to sort of improve how we frame these questions. So bear in mind this was designed as a communications tool to kind of engage the public and give them an opportunity to explore our data. It was never designed to actually genuinely capture people's preferences. The second thing to say is that obviously we're not dealing with a representative sample of people here. We're dealing with whoever visits the OECD website and we know that they are an unusual group of people, let's say. Um, in particular, we tend to get more men than women visiting the site and sharing their indexes with us. We also get more young people rather than old people. But we also know that even just to know about the OECD and its work takes a, it's a certain slice of the population that's represented. We have translated the index into seven different languages, so we're trying to remove the language barrier. Originally, the index was only in a couple of different languages. So we're trying to expand the set and trying to get the, the message out so that we get more and more people visiting. But we, we do know that these aren't sort of data that should be a, a solid guide to how people feel. Just to give an example of one of the other things you can do on the website, you can actually have a look at the responses country by country. So I've shown here Canada and Mexico. We've had over 6,000 responses in both countries. And again, we see that classical pattern that slightly more men than women are responding and slightly younger rather than older people who are, who are filling in the, the questionnaire on site. Um, and again, in both Canada and Mexico, there's an emphasis on health, on life satisfaction, and on education. Also in the top five are security and work-life balance. Further down the list, there are a few differences. So, for example, income and jobs are higher up the ranking in Mexico than Canada. But overall, we're seeing a fairly similar picture in both cases. I wanted to be able to show the UAE, but unfortunately, we've actually only had 137 responses. Um, so if there's anyone in the audience that wants to visit our website and contribute, um, you'd be more than welcome to try and bump up the number of people that we're reaching in the UAE. So the website is the sort of communications tool for reaching out to the public, but there's a lot going on at the OECD behind the scenes. And for a more in-depth look at well-being across OECD member countries, we have a publication called How's Life, and we publish this every two years. We're now in the third edition in 2015. The fourth edition will be released in 2017. What we do in How's Life, we go through indicator by indicator and domain by domain how are countries in the OECD doing, so the How's Life and figures, looking both at overall performance but also looking at inequalities in countries. We also have special focuses in different years. So in 2015, we asked the question, how's life for children? We looked at the relationship between volunteering and well-being. And we also tried to measure well-being at the sub-national level. So going within a country, differences between different regions in terms of well-being performance. Now, we don't have a lot of time today, so I'm not going to go through every single result for every single country, but I wanted just to give you a sense of the kinds of things we can do with this data. So this chart actually shows the current well-being comparative strengths and weaknesses for Germany, one of our member countries. And as you can see, Germany does pretty well on most of the dimensions. So just to explain this chart a little bit, 
the um, stalks, if they're towards the outside of the circle, that means a higher performance compared to the rest of the OECD. A shorter line means a lower level of performance compared to the rest of the OECD. So in Germany, we can see that things like household income, job security, and water quality are well above the OECD average. But we can also see that even a wealthy country like Germany has definitely got room for improvement. So on factors like housing, affords, housing affordability, air quality, and we measure that through exposure to air pollution, and also health status, so both in terms of life expectancy, but also perceived health status, so how people feel about their health, both lower um, than the OECD average in Germany, which is quite a surprise. So moving on to the potential policy applications of this kind of data. First of all, to talk through what we think are the advantages of looking at this dashboard of well-being indicators. First of all, we think it provides a more complete picture of progress, so capturing elements of life that are very often missed in classical policy analysis, from subjective well-being through to work-life balance, uh, personal social connections, and safety. We also think it can help support strategic alignment across government, so a focus on what really matters that can be agreed across all government agencies. We think that these indicators can help us to show the diversity of experience at a very granular and people-centered level. So we're aiming really here for statistics that people can relate to in their everyday lives. I know this is very challenging and in this sort of post-truth era, we're all having difficulty in terms of explaining how our numbers relate to reality on the ground. But the idea really here is to make the focus of bureaucracy a little bit more human. As I also mentioned, we think that this is a more forward-looking approach because we're interested in both current well-being here and now, but also the resources that sustain it over time. You probably want a few more practical, concrete examples. And I've been very pleased to see that a, a few of the different countries we've been working with are also represented here today and have already spoken about what they're doing in terms of policy application. So I've got here a picture, it's a very idealized vision of the policy cycle. Anyone who actually works in policy will tell you it's a lot messier than this and there aren't discrete stages, but bear with me, we'll pretend that this is how policy works and there are different cycles of policy. So there's both strategic development of identifying policy goals, there's planning and assessing policy options, so individual options and how they might benefit people, there's the issue of implementation and the delivery of policies on the ground, and then once you've gone through that cycle, there's also evaluation and review. So how do you know if your policies worked? And we think that there's a role for well-being data at each of these stages. And to give you a few practical examples, we heard this morning about the Slovenian national development um, strategy, so the 2020 vision, where we've been working with the Slovenian government to try and build on a well-being and sustainable development framework to identify priorities for Slovenia for 2050 and this has also been part of a sort of public consultation. So it's been very much a mixture of a data-driven approach, which is where the OECD can help, but also consultation with the Slovenian public. When it comes to assessing policy options, a good example is the New Zealand Treasury, who have developed a living standards framework that they use for screening policy options. So a little bit like the, um, the concept behind what we heard this morning, the, the Bhutanese screening tool, the New Zealand Treasury have also got a sort of a, a framework against which they're assessing policy ideas to see how they'll benefit people. On implementation and delivery, we heard from the UK What Works Centre just a short while ago. Um, another example at the sort of local level is the health and well-being strategies that local authorities in the UK are developing. And finally, in terms of evaluation and review, we're seeing examples from countries like France and Italy. Both France and Italy in the past couple of years have passed a law in Parliament that says whenever they're doing their budget process, they need to assess the government's budget proposals against a list of indicators. And those indicators very often have a strong well-being theme to them, and the, the French indicators include life satisfaction. So it is now in French law that ahead of every budget proposal, they need to do this assessment. Um, and there's a range of indicators that they've selected for that process, and we've seen a similar um, procedure followed through in Italy. So that might sound all very nice, um, but I'm worried that I'm making this sound easy, and it's really not. 
Um, so you've had the good news. The bad news is it is much harder than it looks, and we're still at a very early stage in trying to make this happen. So one important point is that better policies need better measures. The OECD Statistics Directorate have been very heavily involved in trying to support capacity building in terms of collating well-being data. So how do you actually um, engage national statistical officers to produce the data that you need to make these policy assessments? Um, and we've been working in all sorts of different areas from the distribution of household income, consumption and wealth, right the way through to writing guidelines on how you measure subjective well-being in surveys. And coming up in 2017, we're going to have guidelines on measuring trust, both in terms of trust in others and trust in institutions. And we're also producing some guidelines on measuring the quality of the work environment. So there's work to do in terms of capacity building to develop these statistics and make them available to policymakers, and the OECD has had a key role in that. But there are other challenges besides just the amount of information we need. So one of the challenges is our knowledge of the policy impacts of different types of policy options on well-being are still very limited. So this is an evidence base that is growing, but we're still in the early stages. So those concrete examples of where you've got a set of different policy options and they've been assessed in terms of their well-being impact across 11 dimensions, that's rare at the moment. There are also institutional challenges in terms of the degree of policy coherence that you need to make this a reality. It's very, very hard when you're dealing with ministerial silos to actually get them to line up against a, a coherent uh, vision of well-being for the whole of society. So again, we are seeing concrete examples of how to try and do this, but we're at the early stages. So in a sense, some of what we're seeing at the moment is, is more evolution than revolution. We're seeing incremental improvements in how policies are made, but we're not necessarily seeing people sort of tearing everything up and starting again. In a way, that, that's fairly healthy in the sense that we really do want to get this right. And this is a big opportunity for us right now. There is a big momentum around this issue. So we want to make sure that as we introduce it into policy, we do it in a very sensible way, in a way that is evidence-based and in a way that is going to make things better rather than worse. So we need to be a bit patient in terms of seeing the concrete results of this, but there are definitely signs of progress. So just to conclude, the OECD is essentially trying to measure what matters to people. Whether they realize it or not, governments are making choices every day that affect people's well-being. And from our perspective, it's really worth knowing whether the impact you're having on well-being is good or bad. So this is a starting point. To understand if life is getting better for people, we need to look at a range of outcomes beyond GDP. Again, money matters, but it's a means to an end. We have to capture the ends if we want to know if we're spending the money right. So the OECD approach is offering a list of ingredients for a good life, not a prescriptive recipe. So it's about making the choices and trade-offs inherent in government explicit so that we can have a proper public dialogue about what is the good life. It can encourage a more open debate about what matters most and how to achieve it, because ultimately governments should be trying to raise the well-being of their societies. Thank you very much.